Great. Well, thank you, everyone, for being here. My name's uh, Callum Williams. I am uh, an economics writer for The um, Economist magazine. It's really nice to be here. And thank you, Christian. No problem. Very much for being here. It's really nice to see you. Um, so I'm going to kind of abuse my, my 17 minutes and 43 seconds to ask you a kind of bunch of questions which probably are not going to stretch you enormously intellectually in terms of phys the physics, but hopefully will be kind of interesting for um, to people in the audience. Great. So I guess my first question, which I think would be useful for everyone here, is kind of two questions in one, mm -hmm. is to kind of explain as you would to a toddler or a golden retriever what quantum <laughs> computing is and then what Xanadu does in that space. For sure. Um, so quantum computing, the, the way I sort of think about it is, well, there's two words there, quantum and computing. So the computing side, we're all familiar with. We use it in our everyday life. So that can kind of be well understood. But the catch there is you've got quantum before the word uh, computer. Now, our current computers, whether they're our laptops, PCs, cell phones, they use a type of physics known as Newtonian physics or classical physics. Don't have to worry about that too much, but basically it uses the physics that we're very familiar with. If, if I throw you a ball, you're not surprised how it evolves through time. But when you work on the quantum level, that means the atomic level, you're dealing with atoms, electrons, and photons, they have different laws. So this analogy, if you throw a ball, so to speak, it'll behave very differently. Now the reason I bring that up is you can actually use these different laws of physics, known as quantum physics, and use them to build a quantum computer out of it. Now the reason why you'd want to do that is you can get unlimited, um, near unlimited speeds for certain problems. And uh, for instance, one thing, um, maybe jumping ahead here, but we demonstrated quantum supremacy uh, last year, last summer. And basically what that means is you get a very specific problem. Uh, in this case, it's a very esoteric math problem. And you have the world's fastest supercomputer here on the left, and then the Xanadu quantum computer Borealis on the right. You've got the, you get all the rules set up and you say go, and both start you know, computing. Uh, what we found is the one on the left, the conventional supercomputer, it would have taken seven million years to solve this problem. Now, we didn't run it for seven million years, but you can extrapolate how long it would have taken. On the right, we had Borealis. It took two minutes to actually do the same problem. So that gives you the inkling of why you'd want to care about using these weird laws of physics yeah. to do computing. And then, so what is the role of Xanadu then? What, is it trying to bring quantum computers to the world, essentially? Yeah, our mission is actually to build quantum computers and make them useful and available to people everywhere. And that really says everything about Xanadu. We build these quantum computers. Uh, ours is photonic based. So we build the hardware. Then we also have it available to people through our Xanadu cloud. And we make it useful by having, it, uh, having software called Penny Lane, very much like a AWS or Amazon's uh, compute service. You have hardware, software, application, and the user interface where anyone with interconnection uh, can actually log in and use it. Okay. So could you just give me a couple of examples, like real kitchen table examples, if, if they exist, mm -hmm. of where a quantum computer would kind of meaningfully change how a business operates or what a business can do? Yeah, it's a good question. We get it asked a lot. The first thing I always preface is those sorts of quantum computers don't exist today. We have Borealis that I mentioned, but it was for an esoteric math problem. Still an important milestone. Um, in order to solve important business problems, which is what Xanadu is all about, uh, it's about three to five years away is, is, is the goal. And the certain industries or applications are really cool. So finance is a big one. Um, dr uh, drug discovery, so pharmaceuticals. Yeah material design, so think quantum chemistry, and logistics. So these are very, very big industries, multi, multi-billion dollar industries, and quantum can actually, potentially in the next three to five years, make significant inroads in these um, areas. What these areas have in common is that, the, you know, they have very complex systems as you add more and more elements to it. Uh, and as you scale up, quantum computers are the best computer to efficiently and accurately simulate them. And that just means, you know, a supercomputer, our phone, even if you had every phone talking to each other on the planet, would not be able to efficiently model or simulate. And so at Xanadu, we're working with a number of large um, multinational automobile companies on the specific case of quantum chemistry, more specifically material design and next generation batteries. Okay, so I'm going to try and pin you on one of those examples you, you've picked up, so logistics, and give you a thought experiment. Okay. Let's say that we had the technology that you think we'll have in three to five years, mm -hmm. so we've got these quantum computers and they, and they work. Do you think we would have had the problems with the supply chains 
that we had in 2020 and 2021 had we had that technology back then? And if, and if not, why not? I think so. Um, quantum, although it's kind of magical and out there, it's still grounded in reality. And, uh, you know, during COVID, the supply chain issues weren't too dramatic for us. There were some delays, but for the most part, it was business as usual in terms of the supply chains. Now, if you fast forward, like you said, three to five years and we're making next generation batteries, the same sort of supply issues that say, let's say happen in five years time would also affect us. Because if you take battery design as, as a good example, we're actually using quantum computers to tell you what is the best type of battery to build. You still have to build it, but the simulations for a quantum computer gives you a much, much better idea uh, on, say, what, uh, what compound to, to use to build the batteries yeah. or what type of drug uh, to synthesize and things like that. So the, the goal is to really cut out uh, a lot of the, the processing times of traditional computers, which could be months or years. Okay. On this three to five year question, what is the... Uh, so do we have the same problem... Um, in quantum computing that we have in AI to a degree, where we've just got not enough computing power? Or is it a theoretical problem that still needs to be overcome? Is there not enough people? Like, what are the limiting factors constraining the development of quantum computing at the moment? Yeah, one of the things I always think about is the phrase, the world will always need more compute power. Okay. So there is a fundamental need to, to have more and more compute power. There is the famous Moore's law, which says, you know, I think it was uh, announced, uh, this law, this, it's not a fundamental law, but more of a business law yeah. in 1965. Yeah. And it's held true for, for many decades, saying that the number of transistors or the power of a, of a traditional chip will double every 18 to 24 months. Um, but that's running out. There's clever ways to get around and supercompute and, and so forth. But you need it, you know, in order to solve the world's problems and to continue to innovate over this coming century, you're gonna need a new platform. Now, we're, we're biased. We think it's gonna be quantum computing. Um, but it really is, I mean, imagine if you took away classical computers, traditional computers, and said, look, in the 1950s and beyond, we didn't have phones, we didn't have computers, cell, phone, cell phones, uh, we didn't have um, the internet. Imagine what life would be like. So innovation is you know, pretty much correlated to, to compute power. And so we imagine that this century and this decade and beyond will be really characterized by how well Xanadu and others can actually build these, these large quantum computers. Okay, but just just to push you on the on the kind of resource, on, there must be some scarce resource, right? That's not not abundant right. enough. What, why can't we have the quantum computers today? I suppose is another way of asking the same question. No, that's so. Uh, the challenge there is we have all the materials. Yeah. So it's not a say a, a supply chain chain issue or anything like that. They're just really hard to build. Okay. So as you can imagine, you're dealing now with the atomic layer. So you're looking at atoms, electrons, in our case, photons. When you're at that level, it doesn't like to interact with our world. And so what happens is essentially you've got to isolate the atomic world, photons, from our world. If you don't isolate it, then you essentially lose all the power of the quantum computer. And that's why you see on certain approaches having cryostats. You can think of you've got to cool these things down to near absolute zero for them to be really, um, you know, separated from us. Even us looking at it or vibrations or you know, yeah. noise of any yeah. sort can actually disrupt it and essentially it becomes not a quantum computer anymore. So we don't need any new um, supplies or materials. In our case, photonics, we have lasers and, and chip development, everything that we need. But we need to uh, keep that isolation. And that's really the challenge for us and every other quantum computing company out there. And so that means what you're working on now is improving the isolation as you scale, essentially? Yeah, exactly. That's a good way to phrase it. So the proper term is decoherence. Okay. So that means um, you want coherence, yeah. and it goes to decoherence. And what happens is coherence is quantum. Our world makes it decohere. Um, for a photonic-based approach, specifically, that's about loss. So what's pretty fascinating is uh, if we stream movies or have video chats, underneath all our cities is fiber optics. And it's basically encoded laser beams going under our, uh, on the, under, through the fiber optics under our cities. Even then, every kilometer, you lose a bit of the information. It's lost or loss. And uh, even though a quantum computer, the chips we have are size of thumbnails, it's quite remarkable. Um, there's loss even on the centimeter scale. So, uh, you know, to your point, our, our sort of biggest challenge is reducing the amount of loss. Right. And there's ways to do that through error correction and fault tolerance and better engineering of the components themselves. Okay. 
just thinking about the real world uses of these technologies for a bit now. So I guess on the one, I mean, I guess on the one hand, you have technologies like um, cloud computing, which is obviously very important, but which like doesn't have an enormous salience in the kind of public consciousness. Consumers do interact with it, but they don't really know they're interacting with it. Then on the other hand, you have things like ChatGPT that like everyone knows instantly and uses on their desktop. So where is quantum computing on that on that spectrum? I would say at least this decade it will be defined as a cloud platform. And, and you're right. Like if you had, ask the average person, they've definitely heard of Amazon. Maybe they've heard of AWS, and maybe they've heard of cloud computing. But you know, the other day I saw an AWS ad, and all the main applications that you use, all your apps and stuff, they're, they're, they say powered by AWS. There's other companies out there. But you can imagine this decade where you see a lot of the applications for the big industries I mentioned and multinational corporations where it's powered by quantum. Okay. Quantum processes, quantum chips. And it's really, you know, the closest analogy would be, say, a combination of NVIDIA with um, AWS. So cloud platform, but you make your own chips like we do, like, um, a, a, like NVIDIA. But, you know, NVIDIA people have, I'm sure have heard of. Yeah. But they don't really, under, the average person wouldn't understand, well, how does that relate to ChatGPT? So it's all kind of under the hood. I see. And even ChatGPT, um, it takes tens of millions of dollars and trillions of parameters to train on GPUs. Uh, so you can actually, you know, the end user like us can actually play around with these ChatGPT and sort of, you know, type in something and get an answer back. Right. But it all happens under the hood. But it is one of the most, you know, important resources in order for us to see that. Yeah, you mentioned just when we were backstage that you feel that it's a bit like being in the personal computer in the early 90s or maybe the personal computer in the late 80s and the internet in the mid 90s because of the, yeah, because you think of the kind of changes it's going to. Yeah, yeah, it's, that's why uh, we were talking before, as you mentioned, and why it's exciting to get up each day is you're working at something that the best analogy we can think of is early 90s internet and you can see it, you can see what's going to happen. You may not have a clear picture, but you know how important it's going to be. And then in the mid 70s, when you had a PC, say, with the Apple, Apple computers, you just knew something wasn't going to happen. You, yeah. you assume it's going to be big. You assume it's going to be influential. Yeah. And we feel the same way about quantum. And, and really, the reality is, is who doesn't need more compute power? You can unlock, in principle, problems that would have taken generations to actually solve. And in some cases, even if you ran a traditional computer till the end of the time, it wouldn't be able to solve. So it's very exciting. OK, so let's imagine we're here in having the same conversation in like 10, 15 years' time. It's kind of easy for me as like a non-technologist, as, as an economist, to imagine how, say, AI might be in my day-to-day -day life. Like, I might be getting emails from my AI. I might be booking a holiday on my phone with AI. Would, the, would this building, would this world, would this conference look different if your vision of the future comes to pass? We're already in a simulator, aren't we? Well, some people do say that. Depends, yeah, depends how much you believe that, but yeah. Yeah, it's very hard to predict the future. Um, but sort of in, in, in theoretical yeah. terms, what, what would be the kind of thing that would look different? How would it feel different? It may not feel, you know, if you go back to ChatGPT, there's so much buzz around it, and quite rightly, but you're hearing about all of the positive and negative outcomes, perhaps, for humanity. It's still really unclear how even that's going to play out. And if you use some of these ChatGPT or BARD and others, it's cool, but how does that actually fit into our everyday life? People are saying, you know, um, when you go on a website, the personal assistance and things like that. But I don't think we really know the exact extent how even that will change. Yeah. But, you know, you can kind of dream. And uh, I, I think um, quantum computing will really be the chip in the future and really characterize uh, this century. For instance, uh, at the end of this century, it would be great to sort of think these drugs, these medicines, um, these batteries, these materials would not have been discovered without quantum computing. I think that's the best way to look at it. It's like, where would we be without quantum computing? I see. People, um, people do say the same thing, of course, about uh, generative AI. And on that question, um, in mid-March when GPT-4 was released, mm -hmm. um, what did it kind of mean for you? What did it mean for your company? What, did, what does it mean for your industry? Perhaps nothing, but I'd be interested in your reaction. What it meant is I was getting asked every hour by our investors and, and the right. media what it meant for us. Yeah. The reality is um, it's exciting if you look at the broad picture of um, artificial intelligence. Uh, and then quantum, you know, I, I think in the next three to five years, quantum will have its own sort of version of chat GPT. Okay. 
Um, so you'll see similar things. You've always got trends that come and go, and I think uh, a quantum one will come. Hopefully it won't go. But um, so you'll see that sort of thing be replicated with quantum once uh, more and more breakthroughs are, are achieved in quantum. Um, but maybe a simple way to look at it is ChatGPT and others potentially uh, will become more and more powerful. So what does that mean? Well, I read somewhere ChatGPT4 it takes trillions of parameters and a long time and tens of millions of dollars to actually train. So there could be a possibility where quantum machine learning, which is one of the active areas of development by Xanadu, one of the leaders in the world actually, maybe you need a quantum computer that can train models that are more simplistic, but need a quantum computer. So you don't need trillions of parameters. Like, where is this actually headed? It's getting, you know, yeah. do you go beyond a trillion? Does it become hundreds of millions of dollars to train? So there has to be better, hopefully in the near term, better classical models, but maybe that can only be resolved by quantum computing models of computing. Got it, okay. I, we've got two minutes left, so I'm gonna try and squeeze in a few more questions. Okay. Um, so your company has raised a, a, a large sum of money, quarter million dollars roughly, mm -hmm. um, but obviously in the grand scheme of things, compared with Apple or Microsoft or whatever, it's a small company. Yes. So I guess I'd be interested in your view on, to me as a non-expert, it seems that you would need a massive company with the kind of enormous economies of scale, enormous amounts of money and so on to do what you're doing. So where, 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 am I, where do I go wrong in that way of thinking? Well, it, it could be, you know, it is true on the face of it. I would say that if you look at other quantum companies like coming from industry like Google and IBM, they're doing some great work. Very different approach to our photonic approach, but very good. Um, I would say that we probably have the same amount of size of people as they do. Okay. Now, the common argument is, well, they're Google or IBM, they have hundreds of millions of dollars. But what we've seen is they, they still have to raise money internally. They still have to get the buy-in from their managers, very much like we have to raise money as well. So I think it's, it's kind of all fair. Um, there is money other than just being inside Google or IBM, and it really comes down the approach. And we think we have a great approach for scalability using the light-based or photonic-based approach. Um, and also, there could be more than one winner. That, that's kind of our belief. There could be, you know, Xanadu and Google could be the winners, for instance. Um, the industries I mentioned before, they have nothing to do with, you know, Material design, at the end of the day, you know, finance or, or drug discovery, the customers only care what you can do for them. Are you doing it faster or not? It's very simple from that point of view. So, um, but there's so many different industries that you need the uh, expertise. Uh, we're focusing on automobiles, for instance. We're not experts in, in battery development. We're starting to get there, but we bring the quantum computing side of things and they provide the other side. So the reason I bring that up is no one can really dominate or excel in just one industry. So there's more rooms for, for, for more than one winner and also more than one winner in terms of the approaches that you take to build one of these computers. Awesome. Well, um, I hope my questions weren't too stupid. Thank you very much for listening. Christian, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.